Welcome to Mining Over Canada. Join the Canadian Securities Exchange and our partners in a first-hand look into our country's vast mining landscape. Mark Francis here with Canadian Securities Exchange out of Calgary. We are doing a series of interviews for Mining Over Canada, and today we're really pleased to have with us James Sykes, Appia Energy, very active in Saskatchewan, in what is known as the Athabasca Uranium uh, Basin, but in fact, also host to very interesting, unrelated rare earth element deposits. James, we're really pleased to have you here. Hi, Mark. Thanks for having us. And we definitely thank the CSE for including Appia on this and letting us tell us our story. Well, tell us a little bit about the history of that part of the northern northern Saskatchewan and, and what attracted you to it and, and why you're there? Well, the history of the Athabasca Basin area is completely tied up in high-grade uranium. It's elephant country for uranium. Uh, some of the most economic and efficient uranium deposits in the world have come out of the Athabasca Basin. Uh, even if when you look at MacArthur River and Scar Lake, they are the highest grade deposits in the world and it's also the most valuable ore in the world. So, of course, it's a lucrative place where explorers and producers for uranium would want to go. But what has not really been known about are just the rare earth element credits that do exist. And that's actually where we have come into play. Uh, property was, was reviewed by the Saskatchewan Geological Survey back in 2010, uh, following up on discovery that was made in the 1950s. And, of course, back then, people were exploring for what? For uranium. So... They found that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't productive for uranium, it wasn't economic, so they just, everyone wrote it off. But again, the Geological Survey followed up in 2010, followed up with rare earth values, said, wow, these are insanely high. These are comparable to what we see as the highest grade deposit in the world right now. At that time, it was steam comp squirrel in South Africa. And then Tom Drivers, CEO and president of Appia, staked the property uh, with some beautiful foresight, and we have continued working on it as of 2016 and just want to keep that thing going. Very good. Now tell us a little bit more about rare earth elements. There's a, an issue worldwide, especially with the concern about how the CCP in China uh, manipulate their access to strategic minerals and, and strategic parts of people's supply chains. And uh, they dominate the rare earth elements. In fact, they produce more than 90% of the world's REEs, I believe. Is that not right, James? That was right at some point, and a lot of that did come from illegal mining, which has had serious environmental impacts, because obviously when, you, when you're doing things illegally, nobody cares. But the situation has actually changed for the better in that there has been a clampdown on illegal mining, and they've been far more environmentally uh, aware of the actions that are going on. So yes, the Chinese still monopolize the rare earth chain on the production side, which they account for about 65 to 70% of the production but it's that end use production. So once you mine it, once you extract the rare earths, what do you do with them after they're, after they're into oxides? That's where the Chinese really come into play. And they're you know, between 90 to 95% of that further manufacturing where they're creating these magnets. And rare earth magnets right now are, you know, they're the talk of the town and they're rightfully so. They're very powerful and they're empowering the future. Right. So in other words, it's the, the processing chain as well that, that uh, we may be developing further in North America for political reasons. And that should also provide a, a boon to a company such as Appia Energy, uh, presuming it's able to find an economic deposit. Absolutely correct, Mark. And we see that actually happening now. So in Canada, there are a number of rare earth deposits around. Uh, what we have going on at Appia at our Elsa's Lake property, we have some of the highest grade rare earths in the world, not just in Canada, but in the world. We also have, it, it's, the rare earths are all hosted in one mineral, monazite, so that's very favorable. The Saskatchewan Research Council, which is a lab facility here in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, they have recently announced that they plan to build a first of a kind rare earth facility in Canada. This is, this is huge, this is monumentous for not just Saskatchewan, not just Canada, but North America as a whole. And then even yesterday where I've read that Ford is now starting to develop the electric vehicles at their plants in Ontario. 
and there are other other car manufacturers who are doing the same. So we are starting to catch up and really come into play and develop that that whole supply chain from start to end. But we're still missing that one critical part. And what do we do with the oxides after that? We need to make we need to make the metals. That's the mm -hmm. missing part, and that's where Chinese have dominated. Okay. Well, presumably there's enough of an incentive now to deal with that. But before we can even really benefit from that, we need you to further advance your property. So tell us a little bit more about where exactly Alsace, Alsace Lake is, how you get in there, and what kind of work you're doing there. Alsace Lake is located in northern Saskatchewan. We are above the 59th parallel, so we're pretty close to the territory's border. We're about 25 to 30 kilometers east-northeast of Uranium City. Again, Uranium City was basically the start of the whole uranium boom in the Athabasca Basin area. You're just northeast of Uranium City, so you've got road access to almost onto the property, right? Do you get there afterward by boat or helicopter? So access to the property is basically airborne at the moment. Uh, we can fly in. Uh, you know, float planes or helicopters, and there's there is road access to Uranium City, again, which is closest jurisdiction to us, but only in the winter time when an ice road is built. We are looking at putting in a trail that goes from Uranium City all the way to Alsace Lake this winter. If we can do that, that's a huge step forward for us and showing that we're you know we're close to infrastructure, which again Uranium City has. They've got power, which is fully accessible. And it's, high, it's uh, hydroelectric power, so they've got a lot of capacity for it. They've got an airstrip, they've got heavy equipment, they've got people there, they've got food, and again, having that ice road, which connects to the main part, to southern Saskatchewan, right to the SRC lab, that's, uh, that's phenomenal for us. And that's a, again, that's another big game changer for Alsace Lake. So tell me a little bit more about uh, the rock that you found, you don't yet have an ore body because you haven't defined it, but what is the contained value of uh, the dollar value of the metals in, in the rock that you're discovering? So right now, when you, when you actually look at the rare earth market, uh, heavy, the heavy rare, so things like dysprosium and terbium, they're worth hundreds of dollars per kilogram, but they're very hard to find because they don't occur in large concentrations. Then you've got neodymium and praseodium, which are in high demand for rare earth magnets. And again, you're looking at $50 to $40 per kilo for those. Also, these are expected to increase in price in the future as demand is expected to soar due to concentration of electric vehicles hitting the market. You've got wind turbines. You've got all these nations across the world who are saying, look, we got to go green, guys. We got to cut down on air pollution. We got to cut down on on any CO2 emissions and fight climate change. Yes, the way you do that is through, uh, through electrification and green energy solutions. So very valuable rare earths at the moment, and they will be, continue to rise. The other beauty about rare earths is that there's a suite of 15 elements. You have things like lanthanum, cerium, maybe they're not that attractive at price right now, but there are uses for them. And those uses are starting to starting to accrue as well. So even these, maybe they're not worth anything right now, but they could be worth something in the future. Right. So is, would, if you find an economic ore body, to what degree would you concentrate it in, on site at Alsace Lake? And then what would you be shipping south? What, tell us, what, what kind, would it be a, a monzonite concentrate in some fashion or what would it be? That's our goal, is to get to a monazite concentrate. Uh, monaz monazite, monazite actually is a, monazite. Monazite is the mineral. Monazite. Mon monazite is a granitic rock. Yes. Uh, okay. Jill just got bored, I guess, and couldn't come up with yeah. Uh, yeah, unique terms. So the idea would be to concentrate monazite at surface, or at, at the property, and ship it off to SRC as, again, yes. Basically, it'd be like a monazite sand. That's... The way the mineralogy occurs, we've got uh, we've got millimeter scale to micro scale monazite. All of this can be sieved out. Uh, gravity separation, magnetic separation, sieve separation. We can concentrate the monazite, 
and then that's the best way to ship it as we wouldn't be shipping a lot of waste. The beauty of what we have going on at Alsa's Lake right now is that we've got naturally occurring high concentrations. Our average grade uh, of high grade materials that we see at surface and near surface is 16% TREO. When you convert that into monazite, that's about 25% monazite. So that's already pre-concentrated. We've got outcrops that are at 85% monazite. It's literally pickaxe and shovel type of operation. Crush it up, ship it out, boom, done. Right. So you really need that facility uh, at the SRC facility. Again, massive game changer. That's, yes. That is something we don't have to build. We are now just basically an exploration into a mining situation. This, it's that kind of move, or it's, it's, it's that facility in itself that really puts Appia in the highlight, in, into a perspective, into a right. perspective play now. Because again, yeah, we don't have we don't have to raise the capital to make this happen. It's already there. Right. So we don't need, we wouldn't even have to look for a, a large partner to help us get to that point now. Because again, it's already there. And and as you say, you, your the size, scale of your operation will not be prohibitive from a capital point of view. Not at all. No, it's right. it's a perfect scenario. So so tell us a little more, uh, James, about what you're doing actual exploration. You, you found a number of occurrences, you've drilled, you've found intersections. At this point, I don't think you've, uh, you, you've published a resource yet, but you, you have a number of occurrences and intersections, right? Absolutely, yes. And we keep finding more. It's, you know, I, I've seen this through prospecting. Uh, when you're just walking on the surface, you come across these zones, you're like, boom, there's our system. Great. You know, where does it go? Uh, sometimes it disappears, sometimes it reappears, but it seemed to be all over the property, no matter where we went, we were, we were able to find it. And so we, yes, we have just completed 2,500 meters of diamond drilling this summer in one month alone. Very productive. We're very happy with it. Uh, a little bit more on the exploration side of things this year, where we're looking to really understand the system and figure out uh, where can we find these really high grade zones, these, these ones, uh, and obviously trying to find them closer to surface. So we have followed up and we found the system again, everywhere we go with a drill hole. We, you can't really miss with it. So we know this system is large. We're pretty confident that this system, because it's controlled by certain lithologies and other type of structures, uh, we can follow this across the entire lithological corridor of our property, which runs for about 45 kilometers. And we've identified other high grade surface showings earlier this summer, uh, south, of, south of where we've mostly been working, uh, about six to eight, eight kilometers south of where we've been working. So again, it's along this lithological corridor. So we're pretty confident that we can find more of these high grade occurrences throughout the property, whether they're at surface, whether they're near surface or at depth, where you know, we strongly believe that these occurrences will exist and we can find them and then we can start to get to our resource. So if, if you are fortunate enough to get to mining operations, it strikes me as a non-geological professional, James, that you're talking about an ore which will be a very high value per ton. And to, to the extent that you have surf, surficial deposits, there's not going to be a massive disturbance. It's not going to be like a, a huge open pit for a, a massive porphyry copper deposit. This is this is going to be a little more precise and it may in fact end up going underground because of the very high value per ton. Is, is that right? Arc and operation would have a very small footprint with a very high value per ton. And that's, again, when you start to see the high grades that we see, that's how this happens. We don't have to mine a lot. Everything is nice and concentrated as it is. So our footprint is extremely tiny. So yeah, we're, we, we are trying to avoid, you know, the unnecessary open pit type of scenario. Our, in an ideal world, as we keep finding more high grade uh, at surface and near surface, we can, we can easily extract that. Again, keeping the footprint nice and small, keeping a very localized, cost-effective type, type of operation that can help us continue moving the project forward. And no sulfide tailings to have to deal with. No sulfide tailings. Hey. James, First Nations in Saskatchewan are, uh, are pretty progressive and, and oriented toward work and they have a reputation for being pro-mining. Uh, 
there are a number of First Nations in Northern Saskatchewan. Tell us about your interactions with the communities. So yes, we interact with the First Nations every year. Uh, myself, I'm in personal communications with the First Nations communities themselves and also local stakeholders within the area at least a few times a year, just to always update them with our plans before going into the operation, but also what we've done and what we look to do down the road. The First Nations uh, from my past history have always been very pro-exploration, very pro-mining in Northern Saskatchewan. When you consider that Orano and Cameco have their uranium mine sites up there, and they're employing more than 50% of their workforce are First Nations, this is employment opportunities for these, for these bands, for these stakeholders. Again, when there's not really much up there in ways of employment, so any kind of development that they can see happening, they're definitely behind it 100%. Yeah. So James, what on earth turned you into a rock hound? I really don't know. Actually, yes, I do know. Uh, what turned me into a rock hound, Mark, uh, when I was floating around in university, I originally went into biochemistry. Found out I didn't like that at all. So the next year I started taking a whole variety of courses and I took geology, introduction to geology. The teacher there was so passionate about rocks and just about the whole process of geology in the earth that it, it really got me intrigued and I started started really cluing into it. So that was my turning point. And that, that then is when I decided, yeah, you know, I think I want to be a geologist. And then because I'm from Elliott Lake, my dad was a uranium miner. Now, I've always had that that history to my background. And so after I graduated, I like the idea of power. I like the idea of the world having clean energy, which I believe is nuclear energy is the way forward. So I thought, yeah, let's get into uranium exploration. I was fortunate enough to do so, start my career at Venison Mines. And I continued on in the uranium space for quite some time. When I joined Appia, we were still a uranium explorer, but then we got onto the whole rare earth, uh, onto the whole rare earth space. And that's completely transformed my thinking, but again, it's still aligned with, with what I believe. And that's clean energy, and again, electrification of vehicles, and with, uh, you know, with, with wind turbines coming on as well, it's the future. There, there are so many applications for rare earths that it's almost endless. So that really drives me going forward to, to help the world get to a better place. And on a basic level, you love discovery, I can tell. You love every oh, time absolutely. you find <laughs> a new outcrop or, or something new or figure out a new way to chase it, right? The, the it's a rush. It's an absolute rush. And that's when I was originally getting into geology, uh, somebody I talked to, an experienced geologist said, you know, what you've described to me, son, is, is the romanticism of geology. You think you're going to go out there and make a discovery. Most times that never happens. People have worked in the industry for years and years and years. Fortunately enough, I've actually been on a number of discoveries and made my own. So once you get that bug, you just want more and more. And I, I can't tell you how exciting it really is. It's something you have to experience for yourself. But yes, it is very exciting. And I've been successful, successful enough in my career. I have a little bit of a cult following going on with investors and, and shareholders. So obviously, I want to keep them happy. I want to keep this train going forward. So that's one thing that really drives me is you know, the people behind me, the people who've got a lot of faith in me, uh, confidence in my own abilities, and again, just providing for, for the future. The, all three key ingredients that I want to see that, that will drive everything forward. That makes me want to go. One summer, you're going to have to take your wife and children out to turn your children into new geo young geologists, right? My oldest son wants to come up, and I want him to come up too. I don't know if he'd be able to hack it, but you know, just to experience, just to give them the experience of what life is like up there. But I'd would, I would like them all to come up at some point just to see, you know, this is how I live, this is what I do, this is how I work for 20 hours a day. <laughs> yes. So uh, you know, James, a, a friend of mine, uh, Saskatchewan geologist uh, John Pearson, uh, once uh, I, I saw him in in March. He'd been in the in the field in the bush camp all winter. And we were at a buffet because of Canadian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy. And, and uh, he wasn't taking any of the delicious desserts. I said, John, why aren't you taking desserts? And he said, 
I spent all winter in a camp with great with a great cook, and my wife has told me I have to lose weight, and she has spies here. So uh, tell me, how's the bush food? <laughs> Best ever. Can't, uh, it's one of the things you look forward to, and whenever I run an operation, that's actually the one thing I really look for because that is camp morale. I kid you not. After you've worked a long day, you want to come back for the best meals possible. And that it, you can have a very bad day, but as soon as you dig into that delicious grub, it can change your whole attitude on the entire day. So yes, very important key element to any bush work going forward. I, I've heard, I've read stories actually in a book called Sigfusson's Roads about these cooks who used to have to whip up a meal in an, you know a very primitive kitchen that was uh, in a uh, in a basically a cabin on rails that was that was being towed by a cat train and minus 40 and they'd still manage to whip up a souffle so uh, what kind of a facility does your cook have we've actually just got a very standard kitchen there's not much to it we've got an oven and we've got all the all the necessary equipment that you know our cooks would need to do to make our meals there's nothing outside of the ordinary that you wouldn't find in your own home kitchen it's just it comes down to the cook the person who's preparing your meals and again you have to have a cook who is the right for the bush you can't have somebody up there who doesn't want to be up there then it'll just be problematic so you need a bush camp cook simple as that right and how are the mosquitoes up there and the black flies as we clear more of the surface they become less and less, so it's great. And then the wind picks up and they're gone. Otherwise, when you're tromping around in the bush, there's no bush, it just flies. <laughs> right. Not fun at all. <laughs> right, okay. And and is your camp, uh, it's presumably on an outcrop or are you beside a lake? Our camp is situated close to Alsace Lake. We're on a nice sandy point, beautiful scenery, beautiful sandy bay that you can walk out for quite a ways and still not go beneath the waistline or a shoulder line. Uh, the lake is lake water is delicious. The fish are great. Yeah, ideal location for you know for a nice summer getaway. Very good. So James, what makes you bullish on mining in Canada? I think Canada is a great jurisdiction, and they're supportive of the mining industry as a whole, especially with the rare earth side of things. We see that Enercan themselves are starting to be very proactive with advancing critical metal strategy. They want to get behind this right now. So they are helping the, the critical mineral explorers get into this. So that is a big push for us as well, knowing that we've got federal support, we've got provincial support behind us, and also industry support to, to really move this thing along and become a key player in the rare earth space, space in Canada as well. And as you mentioned, the First Nations want to see more mining. Absolutely, yeah. The First Nations totally want to see more mining. We want to help them get to that. We want to help employ them as much as possible. Very good. So how do you see this unfolding? What do you think the future is for the north of Saskatchewan, uh, for your property? What, what do you see doing over the next two or three years? Explore, explore, explore. We need more diamond drilling. We need more meters. And we need some additional geophysics to help us get there. We have more prospecting to do. Uh, I guess I'll touch back on the geophysics. So we did complete geophysics earlier this summer, very successful in that we have seen it correlate very nicely with the, with the systems that we're seeing. So with this, with, with the geophysics actually working, this provides us the window to view the rocks down below, which would help us drill more efficiently, more effectively, and quicker as well. So to get to this stage, to get to the resource stage we want to get to, we need to complete more geophysics to help us with drilling. And then again, we have to drill, drill, and drill. So that's the game plan for the next two or three years. We've also got a lot of high grade near surface. And with that lab coming into play in 2022, as it's planned, theoretically, we could be able to mine that surface material and ship it off to, to the lab. Now, we obviously we would have to do some environmental assessment. We'd have to get the permits in place for that. But we're not looking at open pit burning because it's within 10 meters of surface. We're looking at quarry work, which is far easier to permit than an open pit. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of plus, a lot of additives or 
bonuses to Appia and also Slate going forward. Well, at CSC, of course, we are cheering for your ultimate success and, and uh, very much hope you achieve that. Thank you, James. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you very much, CSC. This is Mark <laughs> Francis with Canadian Securities Exchange and James Sykes of Appia Energy signing out. Thank you.